But if you're talking about technical organizational measures, you know, we most of the time talking about technical measures, but there are organizational measures as well. Yeah? You have to have somebody in your company who, 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 who once in a while has a look at, 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 at the, the, the privacy requirements and checks whether they are still still a state of the art. Yeah. And this is this is an overall process, and this is something we're trying trying to, to, to implement. And the companies ask us, hey, what, what do you do? How is how what kind of privacy setup do you recommend? Yeah, in one company we have we have we have the, the engineers coming coming together with, with the internal law department and just discussing ideas at, at the very beginning of, of the development of the process. Yeah. To just make sure we have them on board. So, in this case that you mentioned with updating your technical measures in case of a car, what happens if the user doesn't want to update its technical measures? Does the car stops? <laughs> Is that, do you provide it with a notice to come back to your uh, authorized service? Or you just leave him alone? So, I'm saying that that's what you, you leave him alone, or you, you say you're, you're not liable anymore. And your warranty is void or whatever. What, what are the options that you give to them? Yeah, or of course consent, like that. Yeah, yeah, totally, 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 totally depends, it depends on, on the issue. I mean, if, if, if we would recognize there is a danger for other people, yeah, we would certainly find a way to, 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 to force it to update it. Yeah. If, 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 if it's just the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the privacy notice, I mean, <coughs> we may be available somewhere on the home page. You're going to send them a letter that is updated, updated privacy notice. If he does not want to read it, yeah, if, if that's, that would, would certainly be, be, be this problem. Yeah. But there, there's a gray area between. Yeah? Let's, let's, let's say, for example, you have, you have this, this, this GPS tracking. Yeah? And then you realize ah, he's, not, he's not the only one using the car, and you have only like, like asked him to consent. To, to the to the to the to the location tracking. Now he's borrowing his car to friends. Yeah. How do we collect uh, uh, um, uh, his friends' uh, consent? Yeah? Can we rely on uh, the driver? Can we say do us a favor every time you 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 uh, let your car to somebody else? Uh, please please obtain valid valid consent and uh, please uh, be in, in full accordance and compliance with with the GDPR. Yeah. <laughs> there is a very solution to it. You know when you let's say drive a car mm -hmm. and you let's say have a speeding and you get a speeding ticket. Yeah. The police doesn't see on image who is in the car. Yeah. You know who pays the ticket. The owner. The owner. So I guess that you can maybe apply the similar principle, just put the full liability on the one who decides to use the car and give consent. Yeah. If this person is not, you know, keeping with his obligation. This person takes full liability. Okay, let's make this example. We want this is we have in, in, in Germany. There, there is there is this is public public knowledge. They are discussing they are discussing a, a, a new business model where they use all the data from the car. Yeah, and uh, they they want to want to make this data available on a non-discriminatory kind of basis to to everybody on on, on fair and reasonable conditions. <coughs> yeah. Um, for example, for insurance purposes, yeah, you, you, you might all have heard of, heard of the, the pay as you drive model. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this model because I might end, might be ending up paying more insurance fees. Then, yeah, but, but um, yeah, somebody's going to analyze how you drive. Yeah, and if you if you're a nice driver, uh, you're going to pay less for the insurance. This is basically basically the concept. Yeah, and there are so many more like use cases. For example, if you're offering um, any um, gas stations uh, would be a possibility to charge um, um, uh, electric cars. Yeah, you want to tell people. Yeah, uh, anytime somebody comes closer to, to such a to such a station, you want to inform him. Yeah, but for that you need you need you need to know uh, where he is actually. Yeah, and um, so let's say you have the consent of the driver to 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 to, to transmit uh, all. All of the of the of the, the location data, and then you say collect it from from everybody else as well, and put, put the full the full the full responsibility on the driver. Yeah. If you if you're honest with yourself, you totally know that it's not going to do anything about it. Yeah. And, and, and can you then can you then process such data, or do you, you 
totally aware of, of, of the fact that nobody has, has obtained consent from anybody. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah, it's responsibility under data protection, and it's going to be on you because you are the controller, you are processing the data. And then the authority is going to come and say, we had some complaints, yeah, we tracked all these people, and this got publicly available, yeah, and, and now we have some bad divorces, yeah, because they found all the people are going. Yeah, and, and uh, please, please explain how, 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 what the hell, what basis were you, were you processing the data? And then you say, well, oh, that's not a problem at all. We, we, we put all the responsibility on, on, on the car owner. Yeah. Authority is not going to get away with that, I, I would say. If you have an authority. Yeah, if you have an authority. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not only in the if you have an authority. You can also have the court to solve the person's file complaint against your yeah. claims for damages because yeah. because the tools have a very I don't mean usually there is something. <laughs> but, but there is start yeah. but there is extend the I think the authority I know but about uh, image it's also I about still think that there is not enough that global authority <coughs> that is based for enough traction and it's very hard at least from an IoT from a digital standpoint to control it and doing this for living. After all these studies um, from a compact collection uh, that I have, I do innovation and I do digital. We dream a lot, we want to improve all kinds of AI technologies, and I have no time to think of an infancy guy who's going to try to keep the whole time on ground. So, this is why I want to give you another contrast on reality and when I also go with your data, which will be interesting discussion to see your things also afterwards. Right. Yeah, but, and then I will hear from them on the <laughs> 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 Trying to bring digital and technical to yes. regulation, and he's trying to find the right balance. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, exactly. but, but to offer to offer some some solutions to this problem, yeah. If you if you if you enter like like right now any of the car sharing things, yeah, and you'd start the engine, there's there's going to be a pop up saying saying uh, activate uh, the the the, uh, the transfer of personal data, yeah. And if you want to know more, click here. Or if you're in the private sector, some cars recognize who is entering the car <laughs> because because it is connected uh, to your phone or something, and the the car in the morning says, "Hey, Richard, welcome." And below, you're not Richard. <laughs> Click here. Yeah. To 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 make there there are different ways to like to like make sure you have consent and the, and the legal basis for processing. Um, yeah. And maybe combining this with the DNA piping. <laughs> when you start driving, you just say you're not Richard, you're not driving that way. <laughs> 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 yeah. Just only that present is not always a solution because what we are doing, what we are going to do when you are the employer and you want to use all this kind of GPS track to your employees, then present is not a solution, right? Yeah, it's not going to work, that's why. And what is just to be done? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a very wrong question. It totally depends on what data. If you're processing the data from the car, for example, let's say you're transporting all the company's money in a truck, <coughs> yeah, um, overwatching, overwatching the, the trucks, the truck's track is probably probably can be based on something else. <laughs> Legitimate interest for 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 example, or it's even part of, part of the employment uh, relationship. This is data processing is necessary for, for, for exercising and uh, uh, conducting employment activities yeah, because it's part of his job to drive the car uh, and it, it needs to be tracked for security reasons, for example. Yeah. But there's, there's, there, there are many things that you, you can't do. Yeah. Processing all <coughs> data in, in an employment contract uh, to the contrary is, is, is possible even though it's sensitive data in many, in many cases. Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions? I'm already way over time. <laughs> feel, feel free. You can yeah. just mention one of the things you were mentioning in OEWS. I have to say that was not a very good example because I work with the other association which is called Cloud Infrastructure Services Providers in Europe. Believe it or not, what they did three years ago is a code of conduct and privacy security. 
which is now almost a fear proof ideal in the protection board. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the whole purpose of the code is exactly what you mentioned that uh, two key points of this code is beyond you know, explaining a bit more for the customers how to do GDPR, how to, to ensure that they understand that their data is, let's say, safely handled mm -hmm. and stored. Uh, most two elements are that all the main elements of the code must be uh, put into the contracts in terms of service of the provider. Mm -hmm. So if you know there was the European Commission initiative, which is now called, sorry for the term, but they call it this Eurococ. <laughs> so Euro, European Code of Conduct and Privacy, which would include every cloud services, which of course each, each cloud service is very much different depending on the layer of the, of the services. And since infrastructure providers found out that actually the basic premise of that code would be, you know, you have a code, but then you can over kind of overrun it with your terms of services and the, the contract. They said, oh, that's not that's not the point. They turned the table and said, no, you need to implement the code into your terms of services and the contracts. And second point, which is very important, is that you must offer customers to store their data in. So if you ask if Amazon stores it, not Amazon stores it. Yeah, well, they have this new option, that's totally right. Yeah. They, they, have, they have quite a lot of capacity in Europe, especially, like I said, Germany, many countries in France, and they store data that simply, by the French local laws, cannot be, in any case, put anywhere in France, of course, they have to put it there. But what I say is it's quite interesting that people really realize by themselves that there is a need, even before GDPR came into force, because code was promoted before that, uh, that there, there is really a need to do something, something that uh, really has to offer the customer some sort of, let's say, security. I think someone mentioned uh, ISO standards. So ISO 27000 memory is the part of this. Yeah. Uh, and I can tell you that um, after the revision of the code and the comments from the ETB, <coughs> actually the main comments went on the security part, more than the privacy. They were quite happy with the privacy yeah. part. They actually more focused on security. security part. And then the question, of course, that we refer all providers is how to ensure that there is a proper third party certification. But I think it's quite interesting to know that there is a sort of understanding <coughs> that customers really expect a sort of, let's call it certainty, or at least there is a sort of guarantee that the data will be totally stored and handled, at least from the uh, from the processor side, so, so to speak. Um, and this, I think, it's um, not well known, and it's, I think it's, it's a bit of a pity, because um, people are not aware, and they always have this, I would say, legitimate concern, like, oh, where is my data? But uh, I can tell you, there is a hope. <laughs> yeah, so you see, you see some companies, uh, like, using this for marketing, yeah? Yes. They're promoting, and they're offering you the EU watch. Yeah, we can you can uh, store your data safely. Okay. Uh, that has become a, a thing. The, 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 this, this is also true if you, if you are in, in the in the in the uh, B two C B two C business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People maybe because of GDPR and Facebook is is, is, is all mm -hmm. over right now. <clears throat> like like people are interested in in, 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 in uh, the protection of, of, of their data. Yeah. Sometimes we get interested in like messing a bit with, with the companies because it's super easy to file access requests and see, see what, 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 what companies do. We, we had a case there was a fine between a supplier and a big automaker and the supplier said okay well let's see and they filed like they have 250 employees filing data on an access request to every single company of, of the whole group. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's, it's like, like employees are using this as a weapon as well. I talked to somebody from McDonald's and they call them letters from help. Yeah, because because they're using data subject access requests uh, to, to, to prepare lawsuits. Yeah. If, if somebody is fired, the first thing some of them do is to, to, to say, okay, you have one month uh, to please provide everything. Yeah, I want to have those 350,000 emails, I want to have them the right way. But uh, you're totally right, data privacy gets a lot more attention than it really had before. You mentioned about the Siemens case, and it's curious to know which were the challenges and the solutions that you faced there in terms of 
incorporating privacy by design, also in terms of documentation, like at contract level, what you can mention as being a must. So I don't know whether anybody has mentioned this, this uh, previously. We, we, did, we did the Siemens Mindsphere project. This is a large uh, platform. It's like a little bit like, like an app store, but, but, but a platform this is, which is offering, offering communication services as well. And I think one of the most, uh, the most important use cases is you, you, can, you can put, your, put your, your own software on this, on this platform to, to control your machines. Yeah? If you're sitting in Munich in a nice beer garden, you can take out your tablet and have a look. Have a look at how many how many uh, pieces of whatever you're producing are produced by a single machine. What will be the next next uh, time for for maintaining the machine? Yeah, and stuff and, and stuff like that. And this this was very well like like recognized by, by the industry. They have a lot of customers, and so they, they decided to, to to make it to make a worldwide rollout. And as I said, they're offering like information services. Uh, at the very moment something breaks in your machine, they're going to push you a notice and uh, via email and say, "Hey, uh, some something is going wrong here. There's a, a, a certain type of, of, of reporting tools, and, and uh, they're offering security. You can have an encrypted uh, VPN tunnel connection to, to to your machine and what and whatever." So, what were the challenges? This is not a really data privacy heavy thing for, 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 for the time being. There's only to a very limited extent personal data. Most of this stuff is machine data. Yeah. Uh, but, but nevertheless, the robot was, was, was quite, quite a challenge yeah? because um, you had to, to like, um, make an overall assessment, let's say, under, under, under German law, what would you need, how would the contracts need, need to be to set in place. There would be the contracts between between Siemens and and, and, and the, the business customer with the, with the terms and conditions, yeah. But you have to take into account that some of the customers are reselling those products to, to, to other customers in the, in the country. So you have the, the whole contract contract set up, and then you had, uh, for example, um, telecommunication issues, yeah? because uh, the question when something qualifies as telecommunication service, yeah. Well, we understand that a telecommunication service is clear. We take out our handy and call somebody. This is clearly a telecommunication service. But there's a gray area as well, yeah? because they have <coughs> this conveyance of signals and, and, and uh, messages and, and, uh, and stuff going on. So we had to ask in 73 countries, does this qualify as a telecommunication service? Because if it does, yeah, there, there's a lot more to, to adhere to. Yeah? Telecommunication service, even though we don't have like, like a clear standards for that, yeah, or comparable standards, uh, are, are in most countries relatively heavily uh, regulated. Yeah? And uh, what is very interesting uh, is that in many uh, security laws, and I mean more like security laws from, from, from governmental authorities, Having an interest in being able to, to intercept and, and to read messages, you know, there were quite quite a few countries where we had to where we had to to to, to comply with with the authority standards and grant the authority upon request access to the data, yeah. And then they have, for example, retention periods. They say you have to store this data for six months. This was not foreseen in the in the in the in the, in the, in the process, yeah, because. The, the whole idea was if the machine is broken, it's going to send a, a, a message to you and say your machine is broken, that's it. There was no storage of such information, you see. Yeah. And then um, we offered, we offered to, to prevent somebody from interfering with the machines. Yeah? Um, what, what was again the name of this, this virus they put in to, 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 to um, impede the, 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 the development of emergency mass destruction? The, the, uh, the United States have to have like, like uh, put some virus into 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 uh, what was it iron or iron or something to mess with their with their their um, weapons of mass destruction program. Yeah. Yeah. We could to uh, the government what the name was. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to prevent this from happening with with the with, with the machines, we had to be an open security. Yeah, and used encryption to have an encrypted uh, encrypted connection to the, to the to the to the machines. And in some countries, they said, "Sorry, it's not going to happen." We said, "What? If you're encrypting this, yeah, we're not 100% sure whether we can 
we can we can see everything your customers are doing yeah? because it was just just a, in some some countries it's not allowed to use a bridge yeah? and then you have you see this offering offering hardware yeah? if if you if you have a bit older machine yeah if part of Mindsby you can you can you can you can buy a Mindsby a, a connect box you just plug it into your machine and then your machine is IoT ready and you can connect it to the platform. And you need you need you need a certificate for that. Yeah. And import and export, <laughs> import and export regulations and tax and whatever. Yeah. So this the the, the the project of Home Authority was very interesting, but it covered it covered not only what would you call IoT but but, but regulatory and tax and, uh, and uh, whatever. Thank you. Well, I have one more question. Quickly, you mentioned earlier um, about the possibility of switching between the connected mode and not connected mode in a car when transferring the data. Yeah. And that seems like a solution or a practice, good to have practice when incorporating the privacy by design in I I IoT. Do you have any other examples as such, such as the practices that have good what best practices they say uh, they say you know, in this field? Similar to that one. Totally connectivity. Like examples. Yeah, just, just examples for, 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 for privacy by design. But that starts obviously at, 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 at the very at the very low level, yeah, that you have to when you start a service, yeah, it is it is deactivated by default. Yeah. But the increment, let's say, of outer of ignis is kind of an example of, of, of privacy, for privacy by design. Yeah. S security is always is always a, a privacy, privacy by design thing, and transparency. Yeah. To have to have the possibility to to to, to inform um, somebody uh, uh, about 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 what the product is doing to change this is is, is a privacy by design a, a feature feature of, of, of the product. Uh, to be able to block access to or to completely deactivate a, a product could be privacy by design. Uh, to make sure, to make sure, if you have a data breach, nobody can access uh, data on, on whatever on the uh, on the uh, mobile devices. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure there, are, there will be more questions also for the last presentation, and uh, I have a slight feeling that. Uh, this new presentation from Vecv will, will become will be a bit different than yours, so that might trigger some new <laughs> questions and comments uh, uh, as well. So Vecv um, Community is the head of digital innovation hub in, in uh, Genpact. Uh, I will pass on the mic so to explain us the practical side, as uh, it was mentioned by yeah. IoT. So how quickly are we going into the other Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to break some reality. <laughs> In, uh, I'm pragmatic, ready for, so I'm going to just try to pretty much show you a contrast of IoT. Uh, my name is Nadine, I'm the Engineer of Digital Central Excellence. Uh, so pretty much in my role, I'm responsible for building digital transformation um, projects um, in terms of infusing data engineering, big data, um, robotics, NLP, computer vision. Um, and pretty much transforming processes and industries between the client that we work with. So to give you an example, we have a client that come up with a supply chain process that we have to manage. And during man and while we're managing this process, we look at how we can infuse digital and how we can pretty much change the way we deliver services to that customer and how this client can obviously change the way that they deliver also services to the consumers. So pretty much is this that's my role. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start with this. The Internet of Things is not a technology revolution. Unfortunately, this is what we, we heard so far. We think that IoT is a technology revolution. I do personally believe that IoT is a business revolution. Um, who are you with me so far? Because IoT is closest to business ever, and it's the most complex and most critical, and it's something which we call it the technical term, the ticking bomb. Because IoT is close to a B2C, it's close to B2B, uh, it is not a front, it is not a back-end technology, it is a front-end technology. Okay. Yeah. 
So, um, for this discussion, I've uh, tried to bring some use cases where we apply SOAR IoT. I'm going to try then to share with you the security um, learnings and data privacy learnings from a, an applicable standpoint rather than from a theoretical standpoint. Um, so, this is one of the um, it's not called IoT, but it's called IIoT, which is industrial IoT. Um, and it's a totally different type of deployments. Um, this IoT can be deployed for big industries where you have to collect data through different devices and you have to transform it and take insights from it. So it's totally different than a normal IoT. It has different standards. Um, so we had a project with a, a huge aircraft engine um, company that they had a huge problem uh, and collecting data from different engines. Uh, and they had to do a lot of maintenance for these engines so they couldn't actually figure out how they can, in one side, uh, monitor the performance of engines and be more proactive on their maintenance, and then how we can use the data coming from the engines to build something which we call predictive analytics. That means how we can predict an issue on a specific engine. Um, so pretty much this IoT uh, project, or this IIoT project, it's saving life and it's also it's reducing a huge cost for the company. So let me walk you through it and then feel free to stop me if you get any questions. Uh, I can get any questions and, and, and see how we can deep dive together on it. Uh, so the challenge was that um, these guys, they have already an IoT infrastructure deployed. Their biggest challenge was how they can transfer the data from the plane to the maintenance uh, guys on the ground. So what they were doing, they were um, actually getting the data real time from the plane, and they were actually storing the data on different databases, and by that time, they cannot process it, because you know the bandwidth and the connectivity was bad, and by the time that this data arrived to the database, it's already too late. So they were looking at how we can do something which we call IOTFH, how we can process the data within the same plane, and how we can structure all these events to be able to send the most relevant alerts to the maintenance team on the ground to know before the problem happens, or at least to know three or four hours that there is a problem with specific plane, so they can plan, uh, they can plan their maintenance system. So that means, for example, um, if I'm monitoring all the health system on the engine, and I would know that I would have to replace a specific part on the engine, and the plane would send a notification to the ground telling them that, look, I will arrive to New York in five hours, you may need to replace specific part on my engine. That's something we should call predictive monitoring. That means that I've already given to the business five or three hours. That means that people on the ground are gonna do their staffing, they're gonna make sure that there is already available parts, so they can actually pretty much react very quickly. And this will have a huge impact on the business. Uh, you will not have downtime um, from, from, a, from a flight perspective. So that's, that's the biggest challenge um, they had with, with this IoT project. And then also they had a lot of false positive and true positive coming from the engine. That means that the data coming from the engine was not all the time accurate. And they were all the time taking the wrong decisions by looking at the logs and they were changing the wrong files all the time in the engine. So, pretty much complex, it's not easy. Uh, so we had to step in on this IoT infrastructure and we had to redesign everything. And this is the biggest gap that people that don't think about. Um, IoT is not about collecting data through devices and microchips. IoT is about the process. Because you can't collect any sort of data. We're, 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 we're all the time saying crap in, crap out. We have all the time to make sure that you're collecting the right set of data. So what we did, we have implemented something which we call CAP, which is a complex event processing. That means that instead of um, transferring the data from the plane to the ground to be processed, we were actually processing the data within the plane itself. So we have created something we should call CAP, um, a local servers that means that within every plane where the engine was already you know, installed, all the logs that were going from the engine to the computer of the plane, and the data was processed real time on the plane and the plane was sending just a notification based on the most important events. So we were not getting all the data, we are getting the relevant data. We have also um, did something which we call machine learning algorithm and deep learning algorithm. 
So we have tried to learn from the behavior of different engines and why a broken part or, or a broken you know part happened. And we were actually analyzing the data during from the true positive and false positive. And we have built something which I'm going to show you next on the next slide, which is called predictive asset management. That means that I can let you know three months or even six months before the problem happens that you may have to take proactive action in change that form. Um, all this IoT, IIoT project helped this company to reduce over 250 million per year, which is a direct PNL impact on their pockets. They have reduced almost 50% of their cost, uh, fired most probably a lot of people, um, and we have been able to help them to uh, avoid uh, 500 major events. And what I mean by 500 major events, they were pretty an event that can cause uh, big issues with the plane. And we have managed to help them build this something which we call predictive analytics. So what I have just shown you is called um, real-time KPI analytics. That means that I'm getting the data and I'm letting you five or three hours before the plane will land that you have to change something. This is a totally different thing. This is that while the plane is landing, I'm using um, LTE, 4G connections, connections, or even Wi-Fi connections to get the full dump of data that was processed by CEP. So, too technical maybe. So, this system is processing on the plane. While it's processing, it's storing the information, but it's giving me the right set of information that I want. When the plane is landed, I'm getting the full set of data. You get it, guys? And when I'm um, it is the full set of data, I'm trying to build something which we call predictive analytics that I'm learning from the false positive and true positive on every plane. And we were able to um, pretty much build something which we call predictive spare part that helped them to uh, pretty much also save around 50 million um, or being added also on the, on the, on the spare part. Of air craft with a specific type of computer from a specific manufacturer, that's correct? Uh, it, it is a specific engine that is available on the two both airplane manufacturers, is Boeing okay. um, and Airbus, but the engine is it's known, I can say, because they're probably the private, but again, they're two. Mm -hmm. Rice Lawyers and G can be whatever you want. Um, so these guys, they have already their engine within the airplane. Right, and they had to you know do a lot of maintenance on specific airplanes. So it was a big, 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 big challenge for them. And IoT um, helped them pretty much and helped us to redesign the entire process from a data flow perspective. Uh, it helped us also to uh, instead of processing the data on a local database or on a cloud database, we were processing the data at edge. We were processing the data in the device itself. In this case, is the plane, and we had learned from the behavior and from the data that we've collected. We did something which we call data staging, uh, data transformation, and we've tried to see how we can uh, pretty much um, teach machine learning uh, to learn from all the behavior of different parameters in the, in the engine and be able to predict breakdowns. So there are two different projects within the same uh, um, IoT, um, and we managed to build around 25 applications for this guys across the globe because this is uh, around uh, 38,000 engines around the globe, so it's a heavy, um, um, heavy project. I'm going to move to another IoT um, type of uh, use cases, and then uh, we can deep dive into security together. Uh, this is somehow linked, Richard, to your point, to um, how we managed to collect, um, and here I will need your feedback, how, how we managed to collect um, data coming from um, um, different cars from fleet management, and how we can predict, for example, the health of specific fleets, how we can help them to change part, and how we can let this um, um, ranking company to know what is the best customer to rent a car to or not. So when we're collecting something which we call hard data and soft data, the hard data is coming from the car. That means um, RPM, oil, etc. 
we were able to predict and let these people when in the health of specific cars and when you have to change them. It's pretty much basics. But before you jump into the car, you have to sign that you can lose the car and that you're okay for you know for me as a as, as a digital company to process the data. So we're trying to match the behavior of the driver with the type of the data hard data coming from the car. So if it was a very interesting project. We were seeing, for example, uh, you are 18 years old, um, um, you have four years experience driving, and then the hard data shows that you're double time driving beyond 6,000 or 7,000 RPM. That means that the average between 18 and 25 is not the best type of people that you should rent a car. Right? And we were not processing PII because we were not looking at the, the, the name of the guy. We were just looking at the average of people, uh, the type of people, gender of people versus the hard data coming from the car. So what do you think about that? Well, there's, there's a way to, to do that, yeah. If you're transparent with, with the people driving the car, yeah. you, can, you can keep the privacy impact very low like by building groups yeah, between, let's say, drivers between 18 and 25 years old or yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, even though it'd be paid whether that's discriminatory or not? You haven't seen my grandma driving. <laughs> <laughs> because, because we're just looking at who, who took the key, who is driving, and we're just pretty much getting some soft data to be able to help them on enhancing current paper base. I mean, changing the way that um, you sign a document, and while you're signing the document, we're just getting some soft information to be able to um, predict uh, driver behavior. But let me complicate the problem. Yeah. Because first, a lot of car companies already have different pricing in terms of their 25. Yeah. I mean, they already offer you a higher insurance because you're, you're a danger to them anyway. Yeah. Um, which could be right. So they already do that. But the question is here if you would use this data in order to give a special price to you as a customer, what if you portray this like, you know, join this project? And next time you rent a car with 20% discount if you drive this car carefully, whatever that means. How would that be really great? Now that's even more uh, personal information because it's given to you as a person. Some people might say you agree to that, you know, you, you consented to it or you entered into a contract on the long term, I don't know. So, so how is that more uh, sensitive from a, from a data privacy and point? Yeah, no, I'm not right way to answer it, but please don't guys you can share the feedback. But consent should be like, you know, I'd like to hear your views, by the way. But it's, it's going to be free consent, no doubt about it, because you have the possibility to save a lot of money, yeah? This is only good for you. <laughs> no, and you, there, there are different, like, like um, legitimate reasons you can you could rely on. You can say, okay, you're entering into, into, a, into a contract, yeah? Which, which, which essentially offers you a pay as you drive uh, 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 tariff, basically. Yeah? And the, the law foresees uh, um, um, performance of a contract as one legitimate reason to, 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 um, to uh, process data. So yeah. if you drive carefully, you drive more. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is already happening. I don't know if you You rent pretty much, you know, and it is totally different prices based on the profile. And this is already happening, by the way. This is not something new. Because if you create a line profile and you're, I mean, 18, 19, doesn't matter, they pretty much correlate the way that you are driving and the way that you are behaving versus the machine and how you've manipulated the machine and that the price that they can give you the next time will be reflected on your behavior. Yeah. But I think that in terms of using from a legal side, it's not only the guest class, but mostly some of us lawyers. Uh, let's go back to your initial uh, example where you look at the data, you create a soft data that is basically included in the decision making model. Yeah. Right? So yeah. That's the end of this. Yeah. I think building on what was asked previously is how do you ensure you use that data? I challenge you that that's also personal data, but let's put that aside. Let's say you create that data that you embed into a, a automated decision making process. Mm -hmm. That says based on something that says people between 18 and 25 
I'm creating drivers, I'm going to offer a different uh, insurance uh, premium for them. Very big uh, example. The question from a privacy side would be, how do you build that into your offering while complying with the restriction that exists under the regulation that say, if you do this kind of restrictive and automatic processing, you need to have some safeguards in place. You can do it based on contract, by the way, or based on consent. Mm -hmm. But if you do it based on contract and consent, you need to have the possibility to have a human intervention, a relevant human intervention, into the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And I would be curious at that end of, of the spectrum. You build in the decision-making model with the soft data. How do you build into that the relevant human intervention if a person says, you gave me a too high opinion, I want you to look at the given of the decision. Mm -hmm. That, that was his example. The reality here is that instead of, let me just explain, instead of using a paper based on a writing, you're using a tablet and you're giving your consent that your data will be processed. It's pretty simple legal. Because you were just putting your name, putting your gender, putting pretty much any information that you're putting if you're running on a brand card, right? It's just like basics. And you have consent that I have the right to process the data. What I'm processing is I'm not processing your name, I'm processing how many renters they come in in specific regions and what was the age and what was behavior based on the soft on the hard data coming from the car in the specific time. These are the democratic that you are processing. Exactly. She, she was uh, asking you if the process itself, end to end, has also a solution that a human can intervene in the process of predicting the specific situation of one customer. Okay, I'm between, I'm 90. I'm not predicting. Not predicting, I'm taking the decision. No. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't going there. My question is, how do you make it relevant? Because you build the soft data that you generate. As it, I've been seeing, there are two processes. Mm -hmm. One is the process that you generate the soft data that is <coughs> link, starts with being uh, personal data, but you generate statistical data? That statistical data, basically, yeah. Okay. And then you build that, that exactly. And then you build that soft in aggregate data into a decision-making model that says, depending on certain variables, this is the... the uh, I usually don't do that. I usually don't do that because what I do is that what we do um, is that we collect this data, which is a soft demographic, uh, we get the hard data, and then we create a view for you, and you take whatever decision you want. I'm not telling you today. I'm a digital transformation company that come in the end, bring data, create insights, and then I get the insight. It's like insights to data and data to action. Okay. I give you insights to data, and data to action is your concern. I mean, it's, it's based on you to take the action you want based on insights. Work on the solutions, but, right? Yeah, okay. you can also work on so that. Uh, but you have all the time somebody like him who is all the time making sure you have the right hand. That actually goes back to the point yeah. that uh, you need to work together, actually. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and we have a lot of discussions around getting the soft data, getting the name of specific people, storing them. At the end of the day, we need just demographics, try to match them to. Uh, pretty much, um, so you can say that I will tax you more because you're 18, I, I better have a data driven conversation. So we're trying to build a data layer for these guys to have a better data conversation because maybe from 18 to 20, it depends on countries, it depends on geographical areas. So you cannot just tax everybody because they're 18, maybe they're behaving well. So we wanted to help these fleet and these ranking companies, uh, carbon companies, to be able to take data driven conversation. And that's what IOD can help. Right. But this is, this is the difference between what you said and the example because uh, what she was pointing out was uh, the case when the data is being used for a business decision, yes. an overall business decision. So we apply all these, you know, like the example that I gave with the car and uh, that offer for 26 year old uh, vehicle insurance. But I am pretty sure that a lot of companies are already thinking about this. That they actually some of them do already. So when they said about personalized pricing, so they say the next step is not is to use this data that is very valuable to us to, to come up with a personalized solution for you. 
And, and, and this is this something that some companies are already doing, some are planning to do it, and I'm pretty sure this is the next step. Because it makes sense from a business point of view. It's debatable if it makes sense from a consumer point of view, and if it's a consumer point of view. From a standpoint? From a moral standpoint? Yeah, I mean, if it's a vendor, it gives you a long machine, you want individual approach. Uh, not if the answer is no. Well, if, 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 you were, if you would be sure that being a Romanian and driving in Bucharest, you have a much aggressive driving, driving style, you wouldn't have to be used to get a bigger rental price when you go abroad. Yeah. Yeah. The point, no, for example, if you're making a personalized offer to somebody, you're making that personalized offer probably based on an automated decision. So it's not going to be a human personalizing the data. So it's no. going to be a, no, okay. the point that she was making was whether when are you putting in place a safeguard in order to make sure that there is a human there that can analyze and one potential solution could be that, well, it's not quite moral, but it happens. So when you rent a car, they have like a very <coughs> small place right at the end of the document with very small letters where they say that if you don't like the rate of the personalized offer that we're making to you, you can challenge it and within six months, you know, when the challenge is going to be processed and it's going to end up in the right department, a person will eventually analyze your request. So it's basically economic reasons why speaking, probably that's but yeah. at the end of the day, human being is the interaction because we, we do the action to insight and then insight to action is somebody looking at the data <coughs> and the um, decision based on based on data at least. But the, the problem is these guys were trying to figure out how we can match the soft and hard data and how we can help them understand better um, the you know demographics and type typology of, of drivers versus what kind of damage happens to the car also. Yeah, I think another challenge here might be Another challenge here might be the fact that when you actually offer a personalized uh, offer to, to, to somebody, basically you will need more data. So in order to uh, provide customized service or a product to someone or an offer, you would need actually more data in order to assess whether it fits into a certain category or not. As of now, as of now, we didn't be seeing every person from these guys asking us to be like more and personalized data, a personalized offer. Uh, but we helped them to uh, pretty much save around uh, four million on their maintenance, uh, which is not bad for a fleet management company. Um, and we're scaling as we go um, this solution to different, um, you know, asset management um, companies. Uh, fleet companies um, and they have different IoT projects on the healthcare also. Um, let me try now to um, show you something very interesting because they usually used to say that the devil is on the details. Um, we had different discussions around um, IoT, um, we had different discussions around regulations, but let me show you something very interesting. Um, Ken um, it is a cybersecurity expert. Uh, what he's doing for a living is buying all the kind of IoT product and he's trying to hack them. So let me show you, uh, we're going to spend um, a couple of 10 to 5 minutes to pretty much see what this guy is going to show us. He's going to literally to show you how IoT is secure today and let's share a few ideas around security and stuff like that. 